I'm going to open up the agendas repo and the projects or, and the project agenda. I'm going to wait a few minutes till um, just to see if anyone else is going to join us. Um, and then we'll start. Do you hear me okay uh, now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just uh, started using on the microphone and was a little uncertain how it uh, worked out. All good over here. Got a new toy yesterday. So uh, I bought my first uh, drone. Oh. So, and I. Uh, been watching uh, and testing out uh, Ron Evans GoBot. So um, the whole idea is to uh, don't use the controller. I want to use the computer to test it. And uh, yeah. so uh, I believe I will have some evenings with uh, some great learning and uh, some fun stuff to do now for a couple of weeks. Awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, and I think that's. Uh, I always it's when you do if it's programming or whatever you do it's uh, you can see uh, you can see uh, the thing for example if you write some code you can see the changes immediately at least if the drone crashes or <laughs> whatever you do so uh, it's kind of inspiring to actually uh, work with that yeah that's sounds pretty awesome yeah so <laughs> Unexpected. Yeah. All right. Should we get started, everybody? Let's get started. So I am going to share my screen um, right now. And so today um, I'm going to do some live coding. You might have heard me blabbing about this uh, Zoom to YouTube service. This is kind of basically scratching my own itch um, because every time there's a study group, um, and actually some of my other Zoom meetings as well, they record up to the Zoom cloud. Um, and let's see if I can show you what that looks like. my account recordings so these are like my recordings day over day so you can see here the go study group recording is not done yet because of course it's going on right now uh, but they go pretty far back all the way back like september 6 and actually the very first go study group is in here as well so it goes all the way from day zero and um, this is cool because it's kind of like a history. Um, and of course, these are all on YouTube as well. Um, but what happens is when the Go study group is over, and, and then I also have a meeting right after this for the Athens project. Um, when those are over, I go in here after these are done processing. You can see it's processing right now. And I go in here and I download it manually to my computer uh, and then I encode it for YouTube as an mp4 and then I upload to YouTube and I put in the specific uh, video description and tags uh, and I add it to the right playlist as the right YouTube account um, and it generally like it takes about 30 minutes per video so I'm looking every week at an hour, um, maybe a little more of just kind of manual work that sometimes I just end up like not doing. 
and that sucks because um, I should be. It's really nice to have all these videos up on YouTube promptly. Uh, and then the other piece is when I'm away, um, if I go on vacation or I've got a busy day, a busy rest of the day on Thursday, for example, um, then those videos don't make it up until like Friday at the earliest. Um, and so it's, this is just a really good candidate for automating all of this stuff um, because YouTube has an API for uploading and Zoom has an API for downloading. So I blabbed about this a bunch last week in the Go Study Group um, Slack channel. And if I go back over to the agenda, um, I talked to a few folks and one of them put together um, a code sample for uploading videos to YouTube. And he's gonna show that next week. Um, so I'm gonna be doing the first half this week uh, and that's here. So I already started and I did a screencast on how to download videos from Zoom. So I started like the skeleton of the project with that. Um, and I have it up on VS Code here. So I'm gonna continue doing that, but I'm gonna stop short of uploading stuff to YouTube. I'll just kind of skeleton and scaffold that part out so that next week we can fill that in um, with next week's live coding. So does that sound good to folks? Yeah. Cool. Uh, before I go on, is there anybody new that wants to introduce themselves? Hello, um, I'm new, uh, first time uh, joining the group. Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> Anybody else who wants to introduce themselves? All right, cool. Um, so for the new folks and a reminder for the old folks, um, this is a pretty uh, informal session. Every week is just kind of informal. So I'm going to go pretty slow doing live coding. Um, if people have questions, see me doing something wrong, um, want to add some of their own opinions, um, really whatever, uh, just interrupt me. That's totally cool. That's encouraged. I would love to hear uh, I think we would all love to hear, you know, what you think if you've got something you want to say. So by all means, do that. Um, and that goes for anything, really. Um, before in the past, we've done these where, like, someone has a really good VS Code plugin that they think would help. Um, that doesn't really have too much to do with Go programming, but it has to do with programming, and it's super helpful. So, you know, if it's something like that, speak up. Uh, and of course, if it's something like, you know, I'm writing a HTTP handler wrong, that's obviously that's cool too. So with that, let me get started. Um, I have the repo here and we have to come up with a better name uh, sometime. It's just called videos. That's kind of lame. So think about that, a better name for this whole thing. Um, but for now, I'll just call it videos. Um, and this readme is super bare, but basically this is a Buffalo application. Uh, I think we've talked about Buffalo before, uh, but I'll go to the website for it real quick. And um, it's kind of just like a full featured web framework. Uh, I sort of, I, a lot of times I say it's sort of like Ruby on Rails for Go. Uh, it's not quite the same, but it's pretty similar. And I love it. I use Buffalo for tons of stuff. You can kind of see here, they have a bunch of features and this is kind of the summary of all of them. And my favorite feature is the ability to just run this command line and uh, just have it do here, do hot code reloading this part. So I can run Buffalo dev and it starts a server on localhost and then you know, I update stuff, I write a new handler or, or whatever, and then I press save and I wait like half a second and then I can just reload my browser and it'll be the new code. 
Um, so it's, you know, uh, among all these things, there's like these amazing features, templating, routing, database stuff. Um, but I mean, this is sort of like the first thing that I saw in Buffalo that made me really want to use it because it just makes my life, you know, easier, I guess. So question. Yeah. Uh, the template thing in uh, Buffalo, how is that compared to the template thing that's uh, standard in Go? What's the benefits or the add? Uh, yeah. For me, um, the benefit, I'm going to click into plush those this is the templating that they use for me the benefit is really um it's just kind of like the syntax is easier to remember and to me it kind of looks more like a pr programming language uh than the go standard stuff so let me give you an example um it's like this is how you define a variable with this templating language and that just kind of makes more sense to me personally um, than the way that you did it with uh, Go or with the Go standard templating system. And then there's some more stuff like the for loops. It's called for. And if you remember back with the Go templating language, it was called range. Mm. Uh, so this makes a little more sense to me as well. And then, you know, if else, it's pretty similar to go um, standard library templates as well. So that's not too different. Uh, but just in general, they have kind of the same features. Um, but again, just for me, it just kind of, it reminds me more of um, Go or other like scripting programming languages. So I end up not having to look stuff up as much. And that's kind of my main, main thing that I really like. Uh, oh, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Someone, Sandeep, was that you? Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Uh, so it seems that Buffalo has made certain choices from what the page looked like, certain choices for certain parts of the web application. Uh, are they very tightly tied together or could they be like replaced if needed? Um, so the question is kind of like how tightly bound are all the pieces of Buffalo? And in my experience, um, I don't know for sure, but my experience is really that the tightly bound stuff is basically the CLI. Um, so that's in this repo, it's go Buffalo slash Buffalo. And the CLI being the entry point to everything um, it requires that you use the Buffalo router. Um, so you run like Buffalo build and it packages the whole web app up. Uh, and it requires you to use their HTTP router. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's, I don't think you really need to use anything else. Uh, so for example, you can use their database ORM, which I think is really nice. Uh, or you can turn it off and you can use another ORM or you can just decide not to use a database at all, of course. Um, and let's look at some of the other pieces. Uh, their test suite is really good, but you don't have to use that at all if you don't want. Um, same thing with templates. Uh, it's got really nice hooks into doing templates uh, with their library, um, but you can also write an API that doesn't have templating at all. Uh, and that's totally cool too. Um, this piece here, the front end part, uh, if you do write a front end app with a UI, HTML and so forth, uh, it does force you to use Webpack to, um, to compile all of your JavaScript and do all the fancy JavaScript stuff that I don't really know what's going on with that. Um, Hot code reload, that's tightly bound as well. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much whatever the Buffalo tool expects, plus the routing is what you have to use. Um, so that would be routing, hot code reload, and the pipeline. And then everything else here is kind of your choice. So I hope, I hope that answers it. I, 
Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I heard one something interesting about Buffalo in a different uh, mailing list, and that is that uh, regardless of whether you have all these files lying around, the JavaScript and CSS and all that, it still manages to com put, uh, combine all of them into a single binary, and you don't have to like carry around the HTML and CSS thing along with your binary. I wonder how they're doing it. Yeah. Um... I learned about that recently, actually, as well. They use this whole package called Packer. And basically what happens here is you create this thing called a box with a directory. And then from that, this library just takes all of the files in that directory and puts them into a Go file with a bunch of constants. And each constant is a string that has all of the file's contents in it. So that's how you, that's how it takes files on a directory and then compiles them all into a single binary. So it's, it's really nice because then you can just compile the binary and uh, send it to your server, for example, and in, in the cloud or wherever, uh, and just start it up and you don't need to have anything else on the disk. So I haven't really messed around with this library at all. Um, I just kind of let Buffalo do, do it for me. And I think it does, like, when you do a Buffalo build, that's how you get this, like, single binary. I think it does some kind of black magic behind the scenes um, where it, like, rewrites your main function and stuff. Um, but I don't... I haven't really looked at the code and actually figured out what it's doing. But I know it uses Packer the best I got for you. <laughs> no, this is interesting, Packer. Uh, it, I think it can be useful outside of Buffalo as well. It's, the name sounds pretty confusing. I think there is a separate Packer somewhere which creates VM images. Oh, hmm. I know there's one to do um, like cloud. Uh, yeah, did you say cloud images? Yeah, cloud images. Maybe that's Packer with an E. P A C K E R. Is it like dot IO maybe? Yeah. I've seen this one too. It looks like really different. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is confusing, huh? Maybe this maybe we should call this something pack P A C uh pack R. Or something like that. I don't know. So, yeah, anyway, any other questions about Buffalo or what this whole thing is all about? Okay. So you can go. Uh, um, yeah, I want to ask. So uh, I read an article saying, like, you shouldn't, like, use any web framework in Go because it can handle all these traffic native, like, native manner. So... Mm -hmm. Like, what, what do you think is the benefit? Um, for me, um, the two main things for me that Buffalo does better than the standard library is the first thing is the routing. Um, so let me show you routing in Buffalo code for this actual project. So I'm going to go into app.go. And this is how to route and get requests to the home path to a specific handler. And the handler is over here. So the handler takes in this context thingy and returns an error. Um, and then I will write down what it would look like for um, the standard library just real quick. Just to kind of show it. So. Oh, uh, can you turn on the screen share? Uh, I don't see. Oh yeah. Um, can any can people see my VS Code right now or no? Yeah, yep. I can see it. Okay. Uh, do you not see it, Sunside? Do you not see it? Okay. If you still can't see, just shout again. 
Um, so this would be, if we look back at the home handler, uh, really what this is just doing is rendering some HTML. Um, so what it would look like here is um, we do a handle func, um, we pass in this home handler and we pass the path. So the home handler would look like this. And at this point, we're kind of at the same, same level of code. And then inside of here, we have to read index.html. I won't make that as a to do. So bytes error equals, let's just say ioutil.read all. I think it's something like that. Is it read file or read all? I can't remember. New file. A read file. Okay. So then we would check if the error is not equal to nil. W dot write. Let's just say HTTP internal server error. And then we would do a W dot write the bytes. Um, so that would be that. Um, and then maybe to do we might have to do some templating. Um, so I left that out here, but yeah, we might have to use like the Go standard library templating, um, or we could use Buffalo's plush just by itself here as well. Um, so this would be like what the standard library home function would look like. And um, we just kind of shortened it to this code plus the comment. So I kind of just appreciate that. I don't have to think as much. Um, I can kind of just focus on like, do I need to write some actual logic in here? Um, like based on what's in the path or something like that. And then I don't have to think about like exactly how am I going to render the template under the hood and how am I going to return a specific status code? And, you know, some of the other, I'll call them lower level concerns. Um, Buffalo just kind of like handles it for me and just don't have to think as much. So I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay. So, but yeah, you could, everything that uh, is done in Buffalo, Buffalo uses the Gorilla framework to do it. Um, and that's a super good one as well. Uh, so I think that's at uh, Gorilla, GitHub slash Gorilla. And then Buffalo uses Mux, uh, and Mux is the routing framework that it uses. And Mux is obviously that's built on top of the standard library. Um, so there's two levels of abstraction here between uh, my code that I wrote in here and the actual standard library. So yeah, I hope that helps. I'm going to delete this so we can compile. Um, so yeah, other other questions? I, I see the chat is blowing up. Let's see. Oh, yeah. The, I forgot to, to check if it was a get or whatever HTTP method. So that's another one. Yeah, you're right. Uh, what What is your name? Uh, MFRW, what's your name, if you, if you don't mind? My name is Falak. Can you say it a little louder? My name is Falak. F -A -L -A. Falak. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that. My my uh, I would have broke <laughs> my my app would have broken because I use Buffalo all the time. And then Sandeep, um, let me. If you go into there, Sandeep, uh, it's all kind of just linked from the home page. And Falak, I I uh, I sympathize. I don't have quite as long of his name, but I have a long last name, and I have to spell it to everybody. Um, okay, so here's where I'm at with the app right now. All of this stuff here 
uh, pretty much all down until here. This is all like I literally ran Buffalo space new on the command line. I did this. Um, actually, let's just see what that looks like. So I ran that and it starts doing all this code generation, including doing all this crazy JavaScript -y webpack yarn, all these JavaScript things that I don't really know what they do and how they work. But it just kind of like fills that all in for me. Um, and now it's downloading all the dependencies that it needs. Um, and I can do this, it can do dependencies in two different kinds of ways even, so you can get super specific. Um, so we're downloading dependencies now. This takes a few minutes, well, maybe a little less than a few minutes. Um, while this runs, I'll just point stuff out though. <clears throat> so Buffalo generates all of this file and it also generates this whole directory structure. So it generated like, here's all the crazy JavaScript stuff. I have no idea what this does. Um, but when I run Buffalo dev or Buffalo build, it figures all this out. Uh, more JSON or more JavaScript -y stuff here and here. Uh, it generates like kind of a stock readme. Uh, I, I changed the readme around a little bit to be more specific. Um, here's all the Go dependencies stuff here and here. Uh, it does Docker for me. Uh, I'm starting to sound like a salesperson, I guess. But um, yeah, so basically it generates this whole directory structure. It lets me do database stuff if I want to, templating. Um, these are for background jobs. Um, this is for like, you can see like my images, JavaScript, CSS. Um, and then actions are where the actual handlers are for the HTTP. So this is where I spend most of my time in general. Um, let me go back here. Yeah, so this is still going on. So where I spend the most of my time is here in app.go. And the reason for that is this is where I write the HTTP handlers. Uh, and really the only thing I added here was these three lines. Um, so I added this Zoom webhook post URL. And that is for Zoom to send me, uh, to send this server webhooks um, when a recording is done. So do people know what webhooks are? Does anyone want me to explain it? Sure. <clears throat> okay, cool. Let me start with the docs here. So what happens is I run a server, uh, an HTTP server, and I'll have to run it somewhere on the public internet in the cloud. Um, and then I tell Zoom, <clears throat> hey, I want you to send me a post request with some specific body in it um, after a certain event has happened. And so Zoom supports um, these five events. So it can notify me with that HTTP request where the meeting start, meeting end, uh, attendees joining and some other kind of join event. And then this is the one that I really care about because um, I want to know, I want my server to know when the recording is done and that kind of starts the whole flow. Um, so, the webhook is the HTTP request that Zoom will make to me, to this video service. And that is the event that kind of kicks off this whole process where the server gets it and then the server is gonna say, oh, okay, I need to go and grab that recording now and download it to somewhere. And then I need to do whatever encoding I might need to do. And then I need to upload it to YouTube. So the webhook is like the event that Zoom sends to us, and that starts the whole process of doing all this stuff that uh, I then don't have to do manually, essentially. So that is this, uh, and Zoom sends it as a post request. And then if I go into the webhook here, um, this is the body of the post request. So it's in JSON. Um, 
Let's see if I can go back to the docs and see webhook docs are here. Let's see if I can go check out webhooks and does it have a body in here? No, I think I have to go to the other link. Somewhere, I forget where, um, maybe it's here? Nope. Somewhere it showed me what the body of the webhook request would look like. Um, I forget where, but I remember copying it into this. So it's a JSON dictionary with four strings in it. Uh, so key value pairs. Um, then what I did was I wrote that post handler here and all of the Buffalo handlers all look like this. So there are a function that takes in a context and returns an error. And then um, this is just administrative stuff. Uh, here is where I tried to decode the JSON. So this looks different than the standard library decoding. Uh, it's just kind of like a convenience function. So I create the struct here, new um, this wh struct. And then I called c.bind in that. Does the same thing as json.unmarshal or decode. So that after, if this doesn't return an error, then my wh thing, my hook will have data in it. And uh, really, this is about as far as I've gotten. So I check the status. Um, and if we go back to the docs for it, let me go back here. Um, status, I really only care about recording completed. So if I go back to the code, recording completed is over here. So I just copied the string into here. Um, so if I don't have that, then I don't care. I return back to Zoom, I return a 400. I'm not sure if that's the right uh, status code to return yet. So I just like put it as a placeholder. I'll write it to do it down as well. So that's that. And then I have a bunch more to do is here. Um, I did, I had to build like a tiny little Zoom client in Go. Um, and I'll go into that in just one second. But basically what I need to do now at this point is, okay, I know that the, the recording is ready, but now I somehow have to like download the recording um, so that I can upload it back to YouTube. Um, so that's where I'm at and I'll just go on from here. Um, any questions before I continue? This is like a good sort of halfway point. Uh, why do you need, um, uh, to have a client? Why, why can't you just download it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I need the client because the webhook only gives me this data. Um, and I don't, I wish that it gave me like a URL for where the recording is so I can, like you said, just download it. Um, but it doesn't. So I have to go and do something. And I, I wasn't really sure what yet, um, but I found this link and I'll go check it out in a second. I have to do something to find that link. Uh, and I have to use the Zoom API. I assume I have to use the Zoom API to do that. Um, and so once I find the link, then I can download it. But there's that like one step between me getting notified and actually being able to download it. Uh, and that's why I think that's why I needed the client. But I'm also not sure, 100% sure yet. But I did find this. And this is the request to get the, this is the request that I can make to Zoom to get all of the meetings recordings. So I, I have to do an authenticated request. There's some data, uh, there's some docs on authentication up here. And this part was kind of a thorn in my side. 
I'll show the code for it in a second. So all the requests have to be authenticated with JSON web token. And it has to have all these specific things with different algorithms and blah, blah, blah. And that stuff's important, don't get me wrong, but it was like, I had to deal with it. So this is what it would look like in Node, uh, Node.js, just to get the auth set up for me. Um, but after all that was done, I can make a get request to this URL. Um, and the only thing I would need to know is the meeting ID. And the meeting ID was passed to me here. Actually, I think it's this one, meeting ID. So when I get the webhook, I can get, I can grab the meeting ID out. So let me just write down some pseudo code here. Um, let me just call this recording list equals, um, let's just say like get recordings for meeting. And then I'm gonna do hook dot meeting ID. And I don't really know if I should use the meeting ID or the UUID. We'll have to just like kind of guess and check later on. So that's the basic thing that I want to do. And then once I get the recording list, I've got a bunch of recording files in it as well. And the reason that there's a list is because if I go to Zooms, uh, if I go to my Zoom, dashboard or whatever it's called and go back to let's go back to the 18th there's like one two th uh, one two there are two that are from the 18th and then there's one from three days later and I have no idea why there are three like as far as I can tell one has um, some kind of audio like some super short audio and then this big one is the one that has the actual video. You can see shared screen with speaker view. And then the last one is also tiny. And I think it has like some preview. I think this is a preview of the whole thing, but it's tiny, you can see here. So it's pretty worthless as well. So really I have to figure out some way in that API to determine what's the file that I actually need, the big one that has the actual recording in it. So going back down to here, I don't know how to do that, but I'm gonna try and figure that out um, based on probably like the recording type, that's my guess. So I'll just keep writing some code here. Um, recording list has to be a JSON object and I'm just going to do like a really rough. This is going to be trying to build a struct with all these JSON, all this JSON stuff in here. So the good news is I don't care too much about most of this stuff. I really just care about this list. Uh, so it's a list of these JSON objects. So I'm going to kind of scaffold this out. Uh, let's just take the UI, UUID, and then struct tag, UUID. Um, so for those who haven't seen this before, this is a struct that I'm building that allows Go to decode some JSON bytes that came over the internet, came over the network. And I want to decode them into this struct. So what I'm telling Go here, this thing is called a struct tag in between these tick marks. So everything here is the struct tag that I've highlighted. And it's telling Go that, hey, when some data comes in over the wire, I want you to take the JSON key in the JSON dictionary called UUID, and I want you to take that value and put it into this struct field. So that's the recording list. And really we're just capturing this. And you can do like subsets. You don't have to make a struct to have everything in it. So I'm gonna basically capture this and then capture um, the recording type and the download URL. And that's where the download URL is where I'm gonna 
you know, download it from, obviously. So then I'm going to do recordings. And then I'm going to do a pointer to recording. And I just do lowercase. And then I'm going to call that JSON recording files. I'll just call this recording file as well. And then recording file. Recording file is this thing. And like I said, I just want recording type and download URL. So I'm going to call this recording type. And that was called recording underscore type. And the, the format of these struct tags is always JSON colon and then a thing in quotes. Oops. So it's always got to be this format and then it has to end with a quote. Um, so recording type and then download URL. So that's pretty much all I need. Uh, and then once I get back uh, the recording list, I will have an instance of this struct. And then really what I want to do is I want to go in and figure out what the records are, uh, what the recordings are. I should call this recordings. Okay, um, so I have a Zoom client, like I mentioned, and I'm going to put, I want to write this function, and I'm going to probably end up putting these structs into that file as well. So the client is in pkg slash Zoom. Um, these are the basics of the client. Uh, it's got all these like foundational things, getting, doing a get request. Here's all that crazy JSON web token stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go into it because honestly, like I did it, uh, I, I think maybe I got it to work on Friday and then I totally forgot about everything. So if you want to know more though, um, this is the library I used and it's, um, it's really good. I think it's used in a lot of places uh, just based on like the number of GitHub forks and likes and stuff like that. So that's the client. This is the basic like foundation. Um, Constance is just where the Zoom API is on the internet. I wrote a little bit of documentation. Um, I stole a lot of the code from this GitHub or uh, this GitHub repo. This repo used the Zoom um, version one API. So I just kind of updated it to use version two. And then in here, this is all I got. So um, I wrote a little bit of code just now that I should copy back in. Um, so this I'm going to copy in to that file. I don't know what this meant. This is kind of crazy. I have no idea. So I'm going to make these exported and then let me write a little bit of docs here. Starting list is the, uh, And then I'm going to do a little bit of documentation there. And then um, like that. And then I'm going to say recording file is, is uh, one element in the list of API is the same thing. So I've got some documentation, that's good. And now I have to build the actual API for it. And what that is going to be is it's going to be a method on the client struct. So it's this. Uh, and then I'm going to call this, I'm going to call it get recording list. Uh, yeah, retrieve all meetings recording. So yeah, I'm gonna call it get recording list, and then I'm passing. The recording file seems to be a list, uh, right? The ah uh, yeah, you're right. So we should do. How's that look? Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, and then the meeting ID would be a string. And then I'm going to return. So what's the, the difference? What's the difference if you use a list of struct and a list of pointer to struct? That's a good question. Um, usually I use pointer to struct um, because then I can pass around this. Uh, I can pass this around with less memory copying. Um, but you have a good point because a list is already a pointer. Essentially under the hood, it's a pointer. So I really don't need the point, the list of pointers uh, because it's like a pointer to a bunch of pointers and each of those pointers is, it's like two pointers in one. So I don't really need that many pointers. So I'm actually going to delete that. So I don't know if that made any, did I make any sense just now? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I see what you mean. Um, okay. and co copy, you can pass the sorry, go ahead. <coughs> I missed some of that. Can you repeat it? No, I uh I don't have anything to say, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay. But yeah, that's a good call. I, I um a lot of times I like to do this like I had before, but, and that means like, I think you, what you were saying is, you know, when you copy it, you don't have to copy the memory, um, but it's a list. So it's already not copying the memory. It's the, the, it's just copying the pointer to the list. So I think even so though, even if I, if I didn't have a list and even if I just had that, I don't think the copying would have been a huge deal. Um, just cause like this is a server, I'm not like Google, I'm not gonna get billions and billions of requests per second or anything. Um, but it's just something I like to think about cause I'm a nerd. So yeah, we'll do that. Um, and then from our get recording list, we're gonna return a, a recording list and an error in case something gets messed up. So what does our get have to look like again? Yeah, I'm gonna copy that in just for reference. And then I'm gonna do a c.get method pass path. And then this thing I built into the get is, it's a struct that um, if you pass the struct, the, this method will try to decode the HTTP response into this JSON. So that happens down here. Um, so it's, you know, if I pass in a non nil thing, it's going to try and decode the response body into that. So I'm going to use that here. So what I'm going to do is um, C dot get, and then the method is going to be a get. Uh, I suppose that's probably redundant. I should probably get rid of that. And then the path is going to be, um, it's going to be slash meetings slash bus um, meeting ID slash recordings. And then my next thing is the JSON recording. So the list uh, has to be a pointer to that struct. Um, and that does have to be a pointer because that's how the JSON decoder works. Um, so I'm going to call list equals new recording list. All right. And then my get returns an error. So I have to do this. And then I have to check if the error is not nil, meaning something went wrong. Turn recording list empty and error. Um, and actually, Sandeep, tell me what you think about that. I think I want to return a pointer here just so I can do a nil here. What do people think about that? Reasonable, maybe. All right, no one spoke up, so I'm, that's what I'm going with. And then the last piece, I'm going to return that pointer to the list and nil. 
And so after this function gets called, if there wasn't not, if there was not an error, it means that this list got decoded and it's full of stuff. So that I can return it, I know it won't be nil. All right. So I've got this thing now that I can call and I'm just going to do some docs, get recording list as the Zoom API call. This. Just one little thing. Yeah. Uh, during my last year with Go, uh, trying to understand all this, uh, the thing about using pointers versus no pointers, the, the, th the thing I've heard uh, repeated over and over again is that if, uh, if the variable or the struct, if the things are going to be mutable or not, uh, so we shouldn't really concerned that much about uh, copying things in and out of memory uh, unless of course it's uh, hundreds of gigabytes but uh, but ju just ju just for myself to try to reason about this is this kind of um, things that thing that's going to be muted mutated or is it uh, this is kind of static isn't it because it's a recording list you're receiving from uh, from Zoom. Um, well, this or one. Am I wrong? No, I actually think you're right because I don't need to return the pointer. I could return just that. Um, but I think to your point, this one, when I create the list, I pass the pointer into here and it will get mutated in there because mm. in, back in the client, uh, this is where it would, right here is where it would get mutated. Because then I pass the pointer into there, and then when the JSON gets decoded inside of that function, um, it's going to put data into this. So it's going to mm -hmm. mutate. But then afterwards, uh, I'm not touching it anymore. And after I return, my, this function is you know, dead after it returns. So it's not going to mutate it anymore because it doesn't really exist. So yeah, I mean, we can we can just do that, and we have to yeah. do the pointer dereference. I'm not so, sure yeah. what is correct, but uh, because this is one of the things, uh, at least for my brain, have been uh, <laughs> the hard, one of the hardest things to 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 actually learn w what is the correct way to do it, and so yeah, so it's. Just to start a discussion, so maybe I understand it a little bit. Yeah, so I can tell you this. Personally, I would do returning a pointer. And the reason for that is performance. If you do this the way that it is right now, you're returning just the pointer to memory. And the memory is like over here, it's on the heap, uh, this thing called the heap, and the heap is totally separate from the function. The function just has the pointer into the heap. Um, and so you have a pointer inside the function and then when the function returns, it returns a new pointer. And really the only thing that had to be copied was those couple of bytes that the pointer is. But in this new creates that thing on the heap. If I do a not a pointer and then I do this, then what's happening is there's no more thing on the heap. There's only, there's data for the whole recording list inside the function. And then when the function returns, it copies all that data into the person that called it, into that function. So that would look like this if I had, um, you know, client dot, what was it called? Get recording list. So that would mean that in here, we have the recording list. And then let me try and go back here. And then it would copy the recording list into here. So now we have two. Mm -hmm. And then after the function call return, then this one from the, this function after it returned, then this would go away. So we've got data being, we've got a potentially a medium amount of data being copied. So kind of just as a practice, cause I don't have to think about it that much. I usually return pointers to structs, not mm. because of 
patient thing, but um, it's kind of more out of habit and it can be beneficial for performance sometimes too. Mm. I think mm. in this case, it doesn't matter that much. So this one's more of like a habit. There's another Thank additional uh, benefit uh, that can happen if you use pointer. Uh, it's something I just uh, found recently. Uh, so the standard library has a sync pool where you can actually work with a, a reusable set of uh, pointers for uh, so that you don't generate a lot of uh, new objects in your app. If you work with pointers, it's much easier to work with the sync pool. And if you're making a high throughput application, that can reduce a lot of GC. Oh, that's interesting. One thing so, I'll mention as well is in APIs, you'll often see uh, if you're doing something just shipping a lot of JSON back and forth, or you need to create a body for an API, if you're constructing it out of structs, a lot of them will use pointers so that they can make certain fields um, nil. Mm -hmm. so when, you, when you post it to, when you post it, if the field needs to be, able to be included or omitted, um, and we see that in like a lot of our cloud SDKs and that kind of thing. And then what we often find is you have little helper methods that uh, do things even for strings, for example, like turn string pointer to string. So you can actually go and use your string and that kind of thing. It can be a little bit inconvenient, but you just kind of understand the rationale behind it. But that, oh, yeah. that, is, that is for the fields uh, inside the struct that do you use pointers yeah. to them. Yeah. That would be like this and then you would do JSON like some string. Let's just call it like some string, and then um, mm. I think you would call it omit empty. I think it's that syntax. I can't remember the exact syntax, but this is saying call it some string. So expect that. But if it's empty, then basically this is going to be nil. And that's what Aaron was talking about. Mm. Then you can tell was it not there did someone actually send an empty string in the json and you can tell between those two those two uh cases perfect okay Thank you. yeah um in the the pool the sync pool sandeep um i have i would love to see that because i've never ever used that before so if you are willing to do um maybe a, pre a presentation on it or just show it or whatever uh, in a couple study groups from now, I personally, I would love to see it. So if you're up for it, go put an yeah, issue. Yeah, sure, in. sure, definitely. It's something I've been reading just now, and uh, I'll love to. Yeah, I'll talk about it. Sweet. All right, um, we've got two minutes left. So what I'm going to do is delete that. Um, I'm gonna check this code in so that it's in the repo. Uh, where are my videos? I'll put a hashtag in my commit message and I will push it up. And then I thought I saw in the chat that someone thinks we should call it Zoom, a Zoom tube. If, if that was you, um, go uh, put an issue in. The, the repo is here. Uh, go study group slash videos. I'll put that into the uh, Slack chat also. And then I cannot read all of this chat right now. Um, but if it has important stuff, put it into the Slack. And um, if, if it's for me, just like uh, mention me in the Slack. Um, yeah, but right now I've got to go to the Athens meeting. So that is it for me. Um, next week, we're going to look at the YouTube side of this. Um, and I'll also screencast doing more of the Zoom stuff uh, as I go as well. So yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching me stumble through stuff. This was a lot of fun <laughs> for me. So hope it was yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Sure. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks the same. Thanks. Bye. Bye.